Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We are so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. So if you're using one of the Bibles from the seats, it's page 396. Um, the passage won't be on the screen, so I want to invite you to follow me. Psalm 32, uh, verses 1 to 11. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely, in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Father, may you be glorified, even as we read your word, as we look into your word and meditate upon your truth. Holy Spirit, we pray you brood over us and draw us near to you, ears to hear and hearts to believe. In Christ's name, amen. I googled the term key to happiness and within 0.33 seconds I got 118 million results. That was pretty quick. People are asking the same question at every stage of life. What's the key to happiness? From kids to adults to seniors, even in their deathbed. If we walk into the bookstore or search online on ways to be happy, we'll come across countless advice, books, life coaches, and a litany of other suggestions. You see, by nature, everyone will look to many people and even travel to many places to learn the secret of happiness. I can't tell you how many people in the last few years have told me that they're making pilgrims to India or to different places, to a particular center, to discover the keys to happiness? Many people make many promises. The question is, does it deliver? The Bible tells us that we naturally are prone to seek after happiness by making external changes around us like new friends, new hobby, exercise, another relationship, gadgets, car, and so on. You see, they're all things that change around us. But in the Bible, the God of creation tells us that the main issue is inside of us, right in the heart, where we naturally stray from God's good plan and fail to experience the true joy and happiness of knowing Him and relating to him. So what's the issue at the heart? The Bible gives one word. Sin. Living a life apart from God. But here's the good news. That God has made a way. And it is found in his forgiveness that is being offered to us. And that's what exactly today's passage is talking about. Namely this, our main point. Only the forgiven are truly happy. Only the forgiven 
are truly happy. David is the, considered to be the author of the psalm. He writes it as an instruction to the people to both learn and to sing. And it's believed that Psalm 32 is closely related to Psalm 51, the story of David getting into adultery and betrayal and murder and hiding his sin. It could be found in 2 Samuel 12. So how does this psalm fit in what happened in David's life? Well, it's meant to serve David's people and us in several ways. First of all, it comes to us as a way of remembering some of the most important truths in relationship to God. Some of the most important truths in relationship to God. Uh, and David makes this quite obvious in his opening verse as our first point. He says, out, just out of the gate, happy are the forgiven in the first two verses. Our second reading today was from Matthew 5 because the first two verses remind us of the tone of the, of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. He says, they are happy in remembering the benefits of being forgiven. What is it? Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The word blessed in Hebrew is translated happy, joyful, exuberant. David starts with a loud shout of real happiness that is only discovered and experienced in God's forgiveness in our lives. It also indicates that a person has willfully gone away from the Lord in sin, but now has been forgiven and covered. You see, David, his sins of adultery, of murder, of hypocrisy are now covered. They're covered by the grace of God. They're covered by the mercy of a God. In his confession and repentance, David is restored to what was broken. Verse 2, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. He went from being full of sin and deceit and lies to now he's blessed because those have been removed. God has covered it from having a defiled character leading a nation, being given a clear conscience now, a godly character once again. You see, to get the true picture of how life is when David did not receive God's forgiveness, we must look to the next few verses of this psalm, Psalm 3 and 4. In it, he tells us, number two, hopeless are the unforgiven. Not that they're okay, but hopeless are the unforgiven. It's a stark reminder that forgiveness is not automatic. God has done everything to make forgiveness possible to us. But we also have a responsibility to namely respond to what God is offering to us. We can't initiate it. Only God can and God has through Christ on the cross. Now, it is us who have to respond. And even that is a gift of grace. Look at verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. You see, earlier we heard how David was speaking from his personal experience of living the entire life, pretty much, without confessing his sin to God, that he may be forgiven and restored to joy and peace. See, silence about sin brought no joy, only distress. When we, when we are not covered by God, but we're covering sin, the only thing that will come is distress. We'll hear a little bit more about it next week in Psalm 42 as well. And that's what he was doing. Likewise, in Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12, David says this, "'Cast me not away from your presence,' And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold a willing spirit. You know what was key to David's life? It was the presence of God. He's saying, Lord, please don't remove the presence of the Spirit from me. Your presence, your spirit, your joy from salvation, 
Give me a willing spirit. He knows that he has lost that. And now he's pleading with the Lord to give it back to him. David knew it. You see, every human heart is born with a natural ability to sin. It's not something we decide once we hit adulthood, well, I'm going to start sinning now. I think R.C. Sproul put it this way. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. That it is by nature who we are. I was born brown. I didn't decide on that. I didn't. I was born 10 and a half pounds. I didn't decide on that. My mom suffered. We're born sinners. We didn't decide on that. By nature, we must be clear about that. Some 15 years ago, well now, some 17 years ago, I sat next to a man in prison who began to tell me out of distress of something that he had done to someone, pretty vicious, for which he had never confessed or never gotten caught. And he thought by confessing it to me, he'll get it off his chest and feel better. What he needed was to turn to the Lord in repentance. And if that was true, he needed also to turn to the authorities in confession. He didn't go into all the detail, but I knew it was something serious. You see, we try everything except God. It is only when we go to Him that we will be forgiven from within. So we're not living in fear, as David said, in silent agony, groaning all day long. That man, he was in agony, and he did not want to seek God. You see, this situation was not just unique to David or this man, but for all of us who choose to live life on our own terms, my way, my way. In, in recent decades, even longer, liberal theology has enroached the reality and the truth of doctrine of sin. It's not just prosperity preaching or overt emotional or cult-like movements that represent, that misrepresent the gospel. But equally devastating is liberal theology that goes beyond the line every time, that removes, softens the Word of God and waters it down. I read about a respectful pastor in the 19th century in Australia who would regularly preach from the Scripture on the issue of sin. One day, a deacon of his church came to him after the sermon and he said to him, we don't want you to speak so plainly about sin. Call it whatever you want, but don't speak so plainly about sin. And apparently he had the support of some of the other leaders in the church. So the pastor stood up, went into the cleaning closet of the church and took out a bottle and it was labeled rat poison. And he said, I see what you want me to do. You want me to change this label that says rat poison and replace it with some milder label like essence of peppermint. Then he said this, the milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. You see, David was done hiding. He was done ignoring, living in avoidance. He calls sin, sin. We know the world doesn't call it that way, but it's been happening in the church, well, from Genesis 3 onwards. So we need to be careful. We don't hide from it. We must not speak less of it. We must speak plainly of it and call poison, poison, instead of peppermint because it becomes more dangerous. It becomes more blinding. For so when I was four years old, living in Sri Lanka, my mom would keep this red little water bottle for me, and one day I thought it was water. There was no label I couldn't read, and I drank it and without knowing it was kerosene. There I go, sitting next to my grandfather in front of our house, foaming out of my mouth. You know, I should have been dead so many times in my life. <laughs> when I think of that incident, and they rushed me to the hospital and pumped it all out, and, and so... We cannot, we cannot look at it any different. We shouldn't be confused about it. It needs to be clear to us of what it is. 
So it happens even in the evangelical church sometimes. We must realize that God's truth is meant to make us uncomfortable. More so, it's meant to convict us like Acts 32. They were cut to the heart. When we were running our kids' camp this summer, I was asked, you know, how do you know when kids... And I said, look for that. Are they being cut to the heart? Pray for that. I pray that for my children every day. Oh, Lord, cut them to the heart. Not because they to please me, but when they are cut to the heart by the Spirit of God, with the truth of God, they are there. They know what sin is. Happiness we chase after will never satisfy because at best it's momentary and it leaves us wanting for more, something better, something more. So what recourse do we have? Well, in verse 5, our third point, he puts it this way. From living in sin to seeking forgiveness because the unforgiven are never happy. They're doomed. From living in inner dismay, the psalmist seeks forgiveness of God with the help of God. I think it's important to emphasize that David had walked in the Lord's instructions from a young age. We know that from the scriptures. So God's ways were not foreign to him, as it was for me. God had given him extraordinary strength and boldness to bite off the bear and the lion and Goliath. He had given him extraordinary strength and faith. And nothing could compare to his zeal. When Goliath disrespected the God of Israel, David was angry. And the zeal of God caused him to respond. So David not just walked with the Lord, but he also tasted the goodness and the loving kindness from God from a young age. And after all, that's what moved him to fight on behalf of his people and honor his king. So from a righteous king to adultery, betrayal, and murder at the highest level, David found himself in a hopeless situation blind to his own sin, reminds us that any one of us can fall into it, but for the grace of God. But when we arrive in verse 5, I want you to take a note that this verse is the pivotal verse of the psalm. It serves as a turning point for David. Look at verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions before the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Nathan confronts him. He is laid low. He needed to be laid low because he's convicted of his sin, and now he confesses. Oh, Lord, my sin is ever before you. Notice three times in this verse, he says the same thing. I acknowledged, I did not cover up, I will confess. That is the heart of repentance. It was a dramatic shift from a year long living in denial. David confessed his sins to God because his sins are first against God. Let me say that again. Our sins are first against God. Where do we find that? Well, Psalm 51 verse 4 gives us indication. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you may be justified with your words and blameless in your judgment. If you're not a Christ follower, you might have a question about this biblical truth. God's Word tells us, because we're all born sinners, and all sin first against God and against His creation, it comes from the heart from within. You see, we're naturally prone to look at the problem from the outside and blame others. But every single person is called to examine himself or herself, our own hearts, of our sins against God. You know, when I'm bound up or I'm tired or feeling lazy or stressed out, I can easily be unloving to my wife and kids. When, I, when that takes place, yes, I'm sinning against them. But first, I'm sinning against God because they're made in the image of God. They belong to God. They're created for His glory. So when I sin against my wife or my kids or against you, I sin against God first. Secondly, I sin against you as well. And so all my sins are before the Lord. We will never know or have the strength to love and live as image bearers of God because that's what we do when we sin against each other in this life. 
unless we are forgiven and restored and filled with the Spirit as David pleads with the Lord. See, I urge you not to walk away thinking that this passage and this prayer is for the outright criminal or lawbreaker. Because David says something that we must not miss in Psalm 51 verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All of us. All of us. Before he committed that sin, he says, well, I was born this way, Lord. You know it. And so I need your forgiveness. So the plain truth is that all of us are born sinners at heart. Some people say, I was born a basketball player. I was born a soccer player. People will say, Maradona will be born a soccer player. The ability. The Bible says, first and foremost, we're born sinners. Base level. You don't water that down. You don't change the label to that. Because that's the recognition that begins the movement for us towards Christ in the gospel. It's in our very DNA. It tracks it back to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And from the sin, all humanity is that way. So David thinks of himself as a sinful person from the time of his birth. Says, in sin did my mother conceive me. You see, the idea is not that the act of conception in self is sinful, but that each worshiper learns in this psalm to trace his or her sinful tendency back to the fall. And we must go there to original sin, to the very existence of that. Not just from birth, not just when we became adults and, or we, had, uh, we became to adulthood. And so as David confessed his sins, he's been restored back to God. He wants to make sure that us, all the people who read this text, will come to terms with this. Number four, it covers the verses 6 to 11, how the forgiven should live. He says, happy are the forgiven. Hopeless are the unforgiven. He says, remember now, if you are forgiven, here's how the forgiven should live. He instructs others in this. It's literally verses 6 to 11 are practical application of how a Christ follower should live out each day of their lives in light of sin, in light of new life in the Lord. Look with me to verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. David encourages true believers to seek God and to pray to Him that He may be found. So what kind of prayer are the godly to pray? Verse 5 tells us, as we just looked at it, to confess our sins no matter how insignificant we think it is or may look. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Another reminder is that when we are in discipleship relationships, God uses those in a number of ways to bring this to the forefront of our lives, of our thoughts. But when we are charting our own course in life without considering the consequences of sin, that is comprised of that imagery of great waters. That David felt the water cover him again and again and again. So he could not reach God. It overwhelms us, telling us that we are unique and read of rescue. We can't rescue ourselves. The God must rescue us. But what we can do in the storms of life? Well, he says, look at this in verse 7. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Two things. First, it was God who was chastising David for living in sin which led him to confess and repent. Okay? There are some people who preach a gospel of saying that God does not want us to suffer or go through any hard time whatsoever. It's a false one. So God is the one who is chastising David for living in sin, which led him to confess and repent. Secondly, it was God who became his hiding place and to preserve him from trouble. See how awesome that is? That God loves me and you so much that he would allow the consequence. He would chastise us as a loving father who disciplines his children. And then he covers him, protects him. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. So when you think of the Lord, 
You've got to see both. The justice and the wrath and the holiness of God, the mercy and the grace of God at the same time. Because they is what collided at the cross and killed His Son and given us new life. You see, our final cause of success must never be dependent on the resources we have. Rather, we must be dependent upon the God who rules and reigns. As you would have noticed, David's relationship to God, and likewise our relationship to God, is highly personal. Highly personal. We must never approach God as someone far removed who cannot or does not understand us. For it is He who deeply understands us and relates to us, namely by granting us the most important need, the good news of Christ. See, forgiveness and reconciliation to Himself is given to us that we may enjoy Him, and secondly, that we may take it to others as ambassadors. We read in 2 Corinthians that we are now ambassadors taking this good news so we can preach reconciliation to the world through the cross. And so it is in that context we have verse 8 and 9. It says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. From his own painful experience, David says to others, hold off, be careful. And if they do, they are given a very unforgettable picture. If they don't listen to God, here's a picture of stubbornness in verse 9. He says, listen, don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or will not stay near you. I've put some images up. You want to be like a wild horse, a stubborn mule that refuses to go where its rider leads? A bit and brittle is not fun. Say by Aaron just came from Texas. I'm pretty sure they're riding around in horses and cowboy hats and brittles. Um, but... It's something that's used to control the horses. David was once like a wild horse who rushed into sin with Bathsheba. But when it came to confessing his sin, he was like a stubborn mule. He knows it. That's why he's using these analogies. And so God chastised him with bit and brittle. Man, that's painful. And he will do the same for me and you, but not leave us there, but move us on to repentance so that we can enjoy Him once again. But it's an important process that the God has put in it. Our relationship to God, we're called to submit to Him and His care for us, instead of needing a bit in brittle. You see, as now he brings it to a close in the last two verses, David draws a strong contrast between the people who are reading the Word and unmoved by the reality of sin of God, of judgment, of forgiveness and joy. And he says this about them in verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. He says, why settle for pleasures that never satisfy, but only brings judgment and chastisement? Instead, he says, receive and be surrounded by God's steadfast love. And so we land on the very last verse. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The psalm ends the way it begins. Blessed are the forgiven. Be glad in the Lord. Shout for Him. You see, it's a declaration for the righteous in the Lord to rejoice and be glad. It is a call for all believers to rejoice in the Lord's forgiveness and call to sing of His goodness. That's what we did, didn't we? As we sang the songs, as we confessed the truth, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. No matter what happens, He will hold me fast. That's why we gather And we begin our service as we sing and confess, as we worship in song, in praise, in devotion. What does this mean to us as a way of implication and application? The Holy Spirit may move your hearts in a number of ways to respond in this.
if you are a disciple, a Christ follower, number one, we must not take sins, we must take sin seriously because we're prone to it. We are, we're, because we're believers, we're not fully released from fighting that. Our old nature is there. And so we're given some application uh, that we should regularly examine ourselves for evidence that the gospel is working itself in our lives. You see, the, there's a reason why the Lord said in Matthew 5 verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. He took sin seriously. That's what took him to the cross. Meaning that even things of great value, if it should hinder us, from seeking and living for the Lord, that we should give it up. If they're leading a person away from God, we should give it up. Cut it off, he says. Don't just put it in your pocket. Cut it off. If a laptop causes someone to watch things they shouldn't watch, put it away. If your phone causes you to do that, do what you need to do. But we must take it seriously. If a relationship is causing you to walk away from the Lord, cut it off. I keep on hearing about it again and again. Oh, I thought it might work out. But then I strayed from the Lord. Be very careful. David says his bones were dried up like in a parched land. We must take it seriously. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us this. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself? That Christ Jesus is in you. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We must examine ourselves as David examined himself. We must not always think it's the other person's fault. But check our hearts. The call to examine ourselves is the call to repent of our sin in us. And as we do that, there are questions we should ask. How do we examine ourselves? In prayer, while reading and reflecting on God's Word, during discipleship, or even in our small groups, we make time to confess sin and to pray for one another. Here are a few questions. Is the forgiveness that I have experienced leading me to forgive others? Am I an unforgiving person? Are my affections for other Christians restricted by my sin? I'm sure it was for David during that time. Does Christ who gave me his life for me hold supremacy over all other people and things, I should say, over my calendar and my checkbooks, over all of these things? Does he hold supremacy? There's more, but here's just some. And when we do get to that place, and we need to repent, there's great promises we find in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this text is not just about beating us down as sinners, but bringing us to the place where we can recognize them with the help of the Holy Spirit. And then repenting. But if we do not repent, then the same text in verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is in it in us. That's what Nathan did to David. He said, you're a liar. You are that man. And he was convicted. That is the heart of the gospel. And that gives us hope. If you're not a Christ follower, then today you're invited to turn to the Lord and to seek his forgiveness for the first time, not on your terms, but on his terms. You see, the Lord Jesus is the only means to forgiveness and joy. No matter how we dress it up, living apart from God's plans and purposes is to first acknowledge our sin and confess it to the Lord. You see, the Lord Jesus made a way. He made a provision that we had, when we had no hope, that on the cross, as we sang that song, on the cross he bled and died. He will hold me fast. If you put your trust in him, that's what's waiting for you.
And I pray the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart of that, that you would respond to His work in you. Because Romans, 9, Romans 10 to 9 and 11 says this, Because if you confess your sin with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's God's promise. If you do, then friend, you'll be forgiven and filled with His Spirit. And as today's Psalms tells us, only the forgiven will be truly happy. Let me pray.